Hello, yeah, welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. And we have already started our section on simple interest rate products. So having defined some interest rate, the most important guy for us is the simple forward rate. We will slowly move from the idealized object of a zero coupon bond two more relevant products that are traded on the market. Yeah, still, the zero Cooper bond is a nice idealized object to represent the interest rate curve, yeah, but actually a zero Cooper bond is well, not a very common product on the market. Our first generalization is the coupon bond. Yeah, it pays coupons. Coupons are just constants. So here this. CI is just a, a constant, so nothing uh, stochastic. It is uh, maybe an R. And you can just consider it as a portfolio of zero Cooper bonds. So we immediately arrive at the valuation that the value is just the value of the corresponding portfolio of zero Cooper bonds. So here we have just to multiply each guy with the corresponding zero coupon bond. Yeah, what does corresponding mean? Corresponding means that it's taken at the corresponding payment time, observed at the evaluation time, little t. So next thing we looked at is the floater. So what happens if instead of this constant, we pay a floating rate coupon? So we pay the forward rate for that period. So now this guy is fixed at the beginning of the period. So it's fixed in, in TI. So at a future point in time, yeah, if we view it in little t before say t1 or whatever. Um, so we pay something that as seen from today is stochastic. And we arrived at the nice little theorem that this is very similar. So we have here the forward rate L, which is just multiplied with the corresponding zero coupon bond, corresponding in the sense that it is the zero coupon bond that matures at the payment time, observed in the valuation time. And also the forward rate is then observed at valuation time. So we have here the, the value of this payment in little, little t. We had two very similar versions of the proof. The first version is just observing that if you plug in the definition of the forward rate, so which is here, then you see that this guy cancels and what you are left with is a portfolio of traded assets. And so you know again that the value of this payment is the value of a portfolio, which you know. So the value is just the portfolio as of evaluation time little t, which is just this expression here. So this expression is just the short notation or some kind of notation for this portfolio here. So that was our first version of the proof where we had here this portfolio. The second version of the proof is actually very similar, but I made it a little bit more complicated by introducing a numeraire, an equivalent martingale measure, and observing that my forward rate is a martingale. Okay, so the numeraire is the guy that is here below. So that is my numeraire. So since this here is the ratio of traded portfolio divided by the numeraire, I have that L is a martingale. So you see in both proofs, but this here is the second version of the proof, in both proofs, I use this special relation of how L is defined and at which point I am paying. Yeah? I'm paying at the unit that is here below I'm paying in the unit of the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the period. So well, that was our first session on these simple interest rate products. And everything that comes today, 
yeah, is more or less based on this. You already observed in the last session that I'm using the special structure that I have a single curve here. Yeah, So there is a relation between the bond that encodes uh, what is the value of a future payment today and my forward rate, which is just defined using exactly these bonds. So later we will give up this property to some extent. And then this second version of the proof uh, yeah, will guide us a little bit uh, how we can recover this uh, COM. But in this section, still uh, we, we, we have this, yeah, this property that we just have a single curve. So let me make a remark on this second version of the proof. So the second version relied on the fact that our index, so here our forward rate is a Q PTI plus one Martingale. Okay, so this was one ingredient and the other ingredient is that we pay this forward rate so this is here the forward rate that we pay. So you see it is now here fixed, right? In units of this zero copper bond. Okay, so this sounds a bit strange. I pay it in units of this zero copper bond, but when I pay this zero copper bond in TI plus one, then this is just one unit of currency. So you have that pay in units of just means that this zero copper bond is just the thing that we multiply with the forward rate. Yeah, so we multiply it with one unit of currency. So I could also just say I multiply it with PTI plus one observed in TI plus one. In the first version of the proof, I have then argued that this is the same as paying at an earlier point in time. So paying at say TI, L times P with length times P of TI plus one observed in TI. So this is the same. So you see, I really pay in units of this zero copper bond. So you see the two things are coupled. It's not only that I pay L times the period length, but it's also important at what time I pay it. So the two things have to be stated together to give me all the information I need for the evaluation. Then if you write this down, you see that you could now define an arbitrary index, say this is called here I, yeah, and you see I pay I fixed in TI in units of N, yeah, where N is now my zero copper bond. And if you then divide by this N, which is your numeraire, you see that the numeraire cancels and then you have the martingale, the martingale property. So now I have here the martingale property for this index I. Since valuation is numeraire at valuation times, the expectation, I now have that this is my martingale multiplied with the units in which I pay, but now at evaluation time. So we will later come back to this special property, but you also see that you could now generalize this here to any linear function of a martingale and you still have the same representation. I just considered in the floater this part here. So I pay only a stream of coupons. In my fixed coupon bond, we also had the payment of the notional. Yeah? Okay, so this is the bond because you get some initial notional back. So if you combine now paying the floating rate and paying 
the notion and in the end you have the floating rate bond if you would like to draw cash flow diagrams you see that now i have coupons yeah and they wiggle a little bit because they are not known from the beginning and in the end you have also an additional payment of one unit of currency or here m yeah so this is my m so what is the value of this guy so the value of this guy here is just m times the zero copper bond that pays in tn okay so this time here is tn so p of tn observed in little t if we go back to the valuation of the floater our stream of coupons has this value but if we plug in the definition of l we see that it's just m times the bond that matures at the beginning of the whole period discretization minus the bond that matures at the end of the whole period discretization so now if you add a final payment you see that this guy here the minus ptn will now cancel and you see that the value of this here is just the bond that pays m at the beginning so in ti Okay, so the value of the floating rate bond is just M times PT1, the starting point of the first period, yeah? because the sum over the floater payments is the difference of the bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end. And now I add another payment in the end. But this is a bit nice, yeah, because you now see that if you have a payment, at the end of the period, so this here is my TN, then adding floating rate payments, so I now add my floating rate payments here, 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 then this will create that this is equivalent as long as we look to the value as paying at the beginning of the period the same amount m yeah so this here is now my m in the end of the period and this is my m at the beginning of the period discretization yeah so maybe this is here my period discretization so the forward rate is just the natural thing that compensates for this time span here it's just the equilibrium interest rate that I need to pay to compensate for this time span. Or alternatively, if you just say, let's pay the amount of M here. Yeah, so let's have a minus M here. Then this whole structure has value zero. Yeah, viewed in a little t that lies before the beginning of all these payments. Yeah, so maybe here. Okay, so if you now add another payment of minus m in T1, then you have that the value of this whole thing, say in little t, and little t is a point here, this is equal to, to zero. So now I have floating rate payments with a notional exchange. Okay, so that's just the summary yeah, of what I've just explained. And I would like to conclude with defining a few terms. Yeah? I sometimes already used it, fixing payment, yeah, fixing date, payment date. And later we need to uh, generalize this even further. Discretization, actually we had different time points. Okay, so I had say, T1, T2, T3. So these were my interest rate period discretization. And for the forward rate, the starting point was the fixing date. So this means 
that the index which I pay is ft1 measurable. So that was my fixing date. And the T2 was then my payment date. So I paid at a different time. I paid here at a later point in time. So this T2 was my payment date. This means that when I value the cash flow, I have to divide by the numerea at payment time. So T2 is called the payment date, and T1 is called the fixing date. And the third ingredients, you know, the third time we had was the evaluation time. So maybe some point here at which I would like to value. So this means I take the conditional expectation with respect to the information I know in little t. So these are now the three times. Yeah, Of course, fixing has to become before payment because I cannot pay something that is not measurable at that point in time because then I do not know what to pay. Yeah? Fixing has to become before payment. Does evaluation need to come before this? Mm -hmm. In a certain sense, maybe yes, but there's also a nice little trick. Um, we could move the payment date around and we use this trick in the proof of the value of the floater. When I argued that paying L at the end of the period is the same as paying L times P, TI plus one observed in TI at the beginning of the period. So this trick is very helpful sometimes when you have to value things. So let's state it as a separate lemma. So we can move the payment date around. So assume that I have times, so there is T1 and T2. So I consider a payment with fixing date T1. So let's denote it with V subscript T1. So you know that the random variable is FT1 measurable, but this guy is paid in uh, T2. Yeah. So I would like to observe, I would like to observe the value in T2. So then the three expressions here are equivalent. So it's paying this amount in T2. Well, if I pay this amount in T2, the value is just that amount in T2. This is actually the same as paying this amount multiplied with a zero copper bond that matures in T2 observed in little t at this time little t. So this is now my V times P T2 observed in little t. So when can I do this? I can do this as long as the little t is after t1, yeah? because after t1, this object here is known and is constant. And I can just argue, hey, this is like paying the constant at an earlier point in time. So I can move this payment to an earlier point in time as long as I do not cross the barrier where the fixing occurs. Okay, so we use this trick. So this is also equivalent to so the value of paying V times the value of paying V times P T2 observed in little t, paid in little t is the same. You can also move the payment to a later point in time. Say now, still away from me. Say now my little t is here. Huh? So you could move the payment to a later point in time you have the amount V at this point, 
okay? What you can do is you can now invest it in a zero copper bond that matures here. Yeah. So a zero copper bond that matures here pays one unit here, has value P of little t observed in T2. So actually exactly the opposite here at that. Okay, so if you buy one divided that, so say one currency, so maybe you could add here one currency, one currency unit divided by the value of the zero comma bond that matures at this point, yeah, then you buy that many units of V of T1 observed in T2 and invested in this zero copa bond. So this means that in the end, when you move here to this little t, you have V times one divided by P T observed in T2, yeah? So this observed in T2 means that you bought this zero copa bond in T2 with a maturity in the future. Yeah, funny, so now valuation and payment time flips. So this is also um, equivalent. So you pay this in little t for the little t after the T2 and here for the little t before the T2, but after the T1. So you can move a payment around without changing the value. Okay, this is a trivial thing, but okay, let's have it stated here because the trick is really, really helpful. What it also means that if you have payments, say at different times, yeah, you have a payment here, a payment here, a payment here. Obviously you see that you cannot just take the sum of these payments because paying at a different time is actually, if you consider value, a paying a different amount. Yeah? It's, like, it's like paying a different amount. So if you like to aggregate, if you'd like to take the value of different things is the sum of the values of the individual things. If you like to aggregate, you need to bring everything to the same time. And then you can take the sum. So this is also what you see from this trivial lemma here that you need to bring everything to the same time. So this is a small remark on the additivity of cash flows with different payment dates. So obviously you cannot just add yeah, two payments. So two payments with the same payment date. Yeah, they can of course be added, but for two payment dates with different payment date, a summation is not meaningful. Yeah, so we need to use this lemma to bring them to the same time. Or there is something better. If you look at relative prices, and what do I mean by relative prices? So relative prices. So relative prices here means that I do not consider the payment V, say fixed in T1 and paid in T2. So I had here the argument T2. I do not consider the payment, I consider the relative price. So I divide by the numeraire and the numeraire encodes the payment time. So it is N of T2. Yeah? So this here is the payment time encoded in the numeraire. If you consider relative prices, you know that the value of paying V is the expectation of this object times the numeraire at evaluation time. So you see there's still here the evaluation time in your conditional expectation and you multiply with the N of little t, the evaluation time. So this means if you do not multiply, taking the expectation of this object is the relative price at evaluation time. And since expectation is now a linear operator, it means that you can combine, that you can sum relative prices. 
regardless of their payment. Yeah? So you can sum up payments when they are already divided yeah, by the numeraire. You can sum up numeraire relative payments. So we have the nice feature that numeraire relative payments or relative prices, they are additive. And this is also very often done. If you implement this, yeah, you just, every object is already discounted. Yeah, so already divided by the numeraire such that you can sum up these payments. Okay, so there is a small warning. This additivity, yeah, which is here a nice feature. Sometimes in applications, it does not hold. Uh, for example, if you have issue or default, yeah, some counterparty can fail to pay. There can be complicated letting structure, structures. So if you owe something to somebody and he owes something to you, if he defaults, do you still have to pay your part or is that uh, yeah, netted with what he should have paid? There are sometimes complicated structures that destroy this additivity. Maybe we can have a look at this later. It's just um, a remark, but here in this risk-free world, this is not an issue. So that was my small discussion of the two products, yeah, the fixed coupon payment, just a zero coupon bond, and the floating rate payment, our, our floater. And now comes a very important product, the swap. And we will define another interest rate, the swap rate. I will first start with the textbook version, which has some e idealizations. And then yeah, I will tell you, okay, what is the product that is traded on the market? Yeah, so where are the idealizations? So the swap is now just an exchange of a floating rate payment and a fixed rate payment. So to some extent, it's just the combination of the two products we have seen, yeah? fixed coupon payments, floating coupon payments. So I have here my L, again, a time discretization, a tenor discretization. So my L is fixed at the beginning of the period and everything is paid here at the end of the period. And I have a fixed, Coupon, let's call it S. So S I is in R. And here I have L with a plus, S I with a minus. Yeah. So if I hold this product, I receive L. Yeah. It's with a plus, I get L. I pay S. It's long, short. You can also flip it. So both are rates for a certain period. So we multiply with the period length, and we pay this at the end of the period. Again, we do this for all periods. So I have my tenor discretization, and I do this here for i from 1 to n minus 1. So the first pay payment is in t2, the last payment is in tn. Yeah, so there's an i plus one here. Yeah, the first fixing is in T1. Yeah, so we have n minus one payments. This is a swap. Yeah, it exchanges, it swaps floating rate payments against fixed rate payments. Yeah, maybe this, why is this product there? Yeah. Okay, for example, if you invest in the market, always at say some short term investment, yeah, you maybe observe only the floating rate. You always get a new interest rate. But maybe you have some kind of business that gives you a fixed interest or a fixed input, a fixed cash flow. So then you are a little bit opposed to the uh, exposed to the interest rate risk yeah, that on the market you can only invest using the floating rate and you receive the fixed rate. For example, an insurance company has a long-term contact with you where you have to pay some regular fee yeah, and that regular fee that 
does not change, it's part of the contract, but they can only invest your money at the market at a floating rate. So maybe this um, guy likes to exchange you know, the fixed rate against the floating rate to compensate his, his risk. Yeah, very popular product this is the swap. A convention is that um, we call this payer swap. The word payer is here related to who pays or receives the fixed rate. Huh? Okay, so we pay here the fixed rate. Okay, so this here has a minus. So therefore this is called a payer swap. If you have a receiver swap, okay, then receiver swap just means that we receive, okay, maybe in a different color. Receiver swap means that we receive the fixed rate, so we get a plus. Okay, so we have a payer or receiver swap plus or minus for the evaluation, that's trivial. What is the value of the swap? Uh, ah, okay, first let me do this. Uh, yeah, speaking of um, terms, yeah, payer receiver, another term is floating leg and fixed leg. Of course, you can decompose, you can decompose the, you can decompose the two payments uh, the, or the payments into two parts. One party pays L, the other party pays S. So then it means that I decompose the swap into a floating leg. So the floating leg is the payment stream that pays L and a fixed leg, which is the payment stream that pays the fixed rate S huh? times the period length at the end of the period. Actually later a generalization, the two legs could have different time discretizations, different frequencies. Yeah, You could pay three months floating on the three months schedule exchanged against every year paying a fixed fee. So there is the floating leg and the fixed leg. So what is the value of the swap? We already have this because we can just decompose it into paying floating rate and paying fixed rate. And we know from the valuation of the floater that we take L and multiply with the zero Cooper bond at the payment time, multiplied with the period length. And the S is just S multiplied with the zero Cooper bond at the payment time. So I immediately have that the value of this floater is the forward rate observed at evaluation time uh, minus S both multiplied with the zero cover bond at evaluation time gives me the value in little t. And now the, I can use this to introduce another interest rate. And this is really nice. Yeah? You, you already saw this for our accrual account. Yeah? We used the forward rate to express that we reinvest in a sequence of zero copper bonds. So that was actually a financial product. And then we defined on top of this, another interest rate, which was our backward looking rate. So here it's a little bit similar. So I have this swap. And now I could ask the following question. Assume that all these payments S here are the same. Yeah, here I have a general case SI, but assume that all this is just an S. What is then, the rate S such that this here will have value zero. What is S, the constant rate that I have to pay that neutralizes all these variable rates? Yeah. Note that these guys here have different periods. They could be different yeah, because there is a dependency here on the time structure when I pay this. So, the question is, what is S 
rate s in a swap such that if you have the value, so here's the value of these payments. The value of this is zero. Drawing again a small diagram. If you just look at paying the variable rate here, so paying the L, I could draw the picture. Okay, you have your different periods of paying these, and these amounts, they could be different in size, yeah? Maybe the interest rate for one period is larger than for another period. They could be different. So here's your period discretization. And what you are now asking is, find S that is somewhat the average you have to pay here. Yeah? Sometimes you are below, sometimes you are um, above. Maybe like this. Okay, so it is a constant rate that um, is, yeah, represents somehow the averaging, but it is a special averaging. Yeah, there is still here the P um, on the outside. This S that fulfills this equation would then be F little t measurable. Yeah, why? Okay, because the whole equation is f little t measurable. All these quantities here are random variables I observe in little t. Solving this equation is of course trivial. Um, you just multiply this here out. Yeah, so you have uh, m is canceling, l times p, the sum over this, s times p, the sum over this. Yeah, all the guys of course with the period lengths. Then you can move the S in front. So you have that sum L I delta I P T I plus one minus sum S delta T I P T I plus one should be zero, yeah? so you can move the S in front. So this guy here is S times the sum. You move the guy with the minus to the other side. Yeah? So you have that this, the two legs, the two legs, the fixed leg and the floating leg should have the same value. And then you divide by this sum here. Okay, so you have that this is the value of the floating leg, the value of the floating leg, which is here, divided by, yeah, not the value of the fixed leg, but say the fixed leg without the S, divided by the fixed leg that would have S equals to one. Yeah? So this gives me now the rate S that fulfills the equation that this swap has value zero. And you see that this is an S of S of T, yeah? because there is still here the little t always inside. If you use the definition of L, you see that the floating leg is just the bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end. Um, but this is not, um, yeah, a transformation that I like. There's another one which I like a little bit more. What you see is that S is a weighted average of L with very special weights, yeah? So you see that here you have a sum where L is multiplied with the period length times the zero copper bond of the payment. And you just divide by all these weights. Yeah? So if this here is a weight, say alpha i, then you just divide by the sum over all alpha i. Before I come to this, let's just summarize this in a definition. So the object on the previous slide is called the par swap rate, par because it is levelizing the swap. 
So of course it depends here on the time discretization, T1 to Tn. And the object that you had here below also has a name. This is called the swap annuity. And maybe another important observation, the swap annuity is a portfolio of zero copper bond. It's a traded asset. So this is a zero bond portfolio and it's called the swap annuity. So continuing, I stated that, okay, uh, an interpretation of this formula that I like is that the swap rate is a weighted average, actually a convex combination of the forward rates. So going back to the definition, you see that every L is multiplied with a weight. Let's call this weight alpha, yeah? say alpha K for LK. Then you have that the swap rate is a convex combination of the forward rate, namely the sum alpha K LK, where the alpha Ks are just the weights the bond that matures in TK plus one. So the natural payment time of the L, K, times the period length divided by the sum of all those weights. Yeah, if for example, the bond would be equal to one, say interest rates are very low. If interest rates are zero, the bond is equal to one. If this here is very close to one, uh, yeah, consider this case. So you can drop this. So you see that this is just weightening with the proportion of the period lengths in your time discretization. So usually your period discretization is equi-spaced, equally evenly spaced. So then this is just the one divided by N. Yeah? or in our case, we have N minus one periods, then it's just the one divided by N minus one. So it's just the one divided by number of rates that occur there. Yeah? So then it's just a natural arithmetic average. If the period discretization is not even, yeah, you are of course weightening the rates that have a longer period discretization yeah, with a higher weight. In addition, there's also a time preference inside. So we have the zero copper bond here. Yeah? So rates that occur earlier get a higher weight. Yeah, the proof for the relations I had here is just trivial, plug in the definition of L. You see that this is the expression for the swap rate. So that was an important product, the swap and the swap rate. But now I would like to, yeah, I would like to remove the idealizations and discuss a little bit how the swap looks on the market. So we already had day count conventions where you saw that, okay, actually the T minus S yeah, has to be defined how, how the market defines this, this time span. And when we discussed here the backward looking rate, I mentioned that um, an application is here the repeated reinvestment in a daily rate. And for example, if you look here on the definition of this short term rate, the Euro STR, the ESTA, then you see that this is published on each target to business day. So the time discretizations we are talking here about actually depends on what is a business day? Why? Yeah, because fixing means observing something, but you only observe this when the market is open. And payment means that you pay something, but the payment only occurs when the market is operating. So you only pay on a business day. You do not pay on a Saturday or a Sunday, for example. And this target two here means that there is, um, yeah, maybe a special definition which days are considered business days. So we have to talk a little bit on how these time discretizations are defined. 
So we looked at the textbook swap and in our definition on the textbook swap, we had here our L of TI, TI plus one for the period from TI to TI plus one fixed in TI. So this is fixing paid in TI plus one. So very special. I always fix at the beginning of the period and I always pay at the end of the period. At the end of the period is the beginning of the next period. So swaps traded on the market are a bit different that the fixing and the payment has to occur on a business day. For that reason, there is a business day calendar and there is a so-called roll convention, which basically means, are you rounding up or are you rounding down? Yeah. So are you taking the business day that was before or are you taking the business day that is after if you land on a non-business day? We can have a short look at an implementation. Yeah, so maybe you can study this a little bit. Yeah, it's not so interesting for our mathematical uh, calculations. This we 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 just assume that we have a given time discretization that is already correct. But if you like to value a really a swap using this market standard, then you maybe need this. So here is, for example, a business day calendar. Here is an interface describing a business day calendar. So it has some enums here, days, business days, weeks, and so on. And then it just has a function that tells me is a day a business day. And it has a function that can adjust a given date to a business day using some date roll convention. So you can look up these date roll conventions, yeah, the following, the preceding, or well, there's also the modified following and modified preceding, which means you go to the following, but only if you do not fall into the next months, otherwise you to take the preceding. And then there are different implementations of this interface. Yeah? So first I specify the interface so that I can plug in different calendars into different algorithms. And then there are maybe different calendars. Some depend on a city. And here you also see the target holiday calendar, which checks if we have a weekday or if there is Eastern uh, or Labor Day, Christmas and whatever. Based on this, we then create the schedule of a swap. So what you first do is you say, I would like to trade a swap that has these periods. And these are the interest rate periods that are used in the day count conventions. So this here is, for example, T4 minus T3, which is the day count fraction or day count convention from T3 to T4. So this stays, yeah, it is okay to have interest rate periods that start on a Saturday and uh, and on a Sunday, that's perfectly okay because you just need the convention to measure the distance. Yeah, So you, you can define that you also accrue interest on a Saturday or on a Sunday, but you do not pay it. So for the payment date, it is that you take the T4 and maybe you take the next business day that comes after T4 for a payment date. Yeah? So this here is the payment date. So if this is period one, this is period two. Yeah, so maybe this here is period three. So then I would say this is payment date three. Yeah, so I would call it now T superscript P three. Then I have a fixing. Yeah? So fixing is maybe a little bit before tf3 so this is the fixing 
it is on the business day before. And suddenly you see that you have in this schedule, you have suddenly four different dates. It is the period start date, the period end date, the period fixing date for your index and the period payment date for your payment. So schedules usually consist of an array of periods. So we have an array of periods and each of these guys then have a period start date, a period end date. So period end date. So maybe I now make the period end date here T3 end. Yeah? And this guy is my T three start, the period start date, period end date. Still, I have that the period end date for period three is the period start date of period four. That remains. And we have a fixing date and a payment date. So fixing date for the index, payment date. And of course, there is a date count convention associated with this whole structure. So these are the uh, ugly things that made up the schedule of a swap. So you can also look this up. Here you see there is a schedule. So a schedule is just an array of periods. And if you look up a period, a period is just a structure that has now these four dates, yeah, period start, period end, but also fixing and payment. And there is a complicated algorithm that can generate this schedule by, for example, first generating all the periods. Yeah? So he is looping here over all periods. And then he is adjusting the end date and the start date to get the corresponding fixing yeah so he is performing adjustments on the business day calendar to get the corresponding fixing date and the corresponding payment date from the start date and the end date and sometimes there are also offsets in the contract that says okay fixing has to be two business days before uh, the period starts payment has to be two business days after this is a little bit related to if I have a forward rate, yeah, then I always fix at the beginning of the period. If you have a backward rate, of course, you just determine the rate and you determine the rate at the end. So this is maybe a small excursion on market conventions. And if you are interested, you can, or if you need this at some point in time to value a true market swap, yeah, you can have a look at this code here. Based on this or using this, I would like to define now a more generalized swap, but I also will generalize the index that we pay. So in practice, swaps are more generalized, more general compared to our textbook uh, definition. Each leg, yeah, the fixed leg and the float leg can have its own tenor discretization. So the two time discretizations can be different between the two legs. And it can also happen that, for example, in the float leg, you pay not only the floating rate, but you pay the floating rate plus some small additional constant, yeah, a so-called spread. Um, so and if you look at this, you see, Actually, it does not make sense to just define a swap that has these very general legs. You just see that it's enough to just define a swap leg. So I just define a swap leg and this swap leg is just a linear combination alpha times L, Ti, Ti plus one, yeah. Well, fixed in Ti, well, this is maybe an adjusted date, alpha plus L, 
uh, alpha, sorry, alpha times L plus some constant, yeah, say CI, yeah, or let's call it little si because it is the spread. If I have this generous structure, which is just a linear function of L, then I can create the pure floating leg, alpha is equal to one, S is equal to zero. And I can create the pure fixed leg, alpha is equal to zero. But I can also create all kinds of combinations. So it is enough to just define such an object. And maybe I even generalize this more. I just pay some index i. Yeah? So this index could also be the backward rate. Yeah? I just pay some index i of ti. Yeah? And maybe the index doesn't need to be fixed at the beginning of the period. So this is the fixing time ti superscript f, and it could also be fixed at the end of the period, like in a backward rate. If I have this situation, so this is here for period i, I just need to value a stream of payments that has this form. It's a linear function of some index with on, on a regular schedule. So I just define now here the, the generalized swap. So I have some tenor discretizations, which could be period start, period end, you know, as we had before. And with that, um, I associate now fixing dates and payment dates for the i-th period, yeah, for the period from ti to ti plus one. I have an index, my floating rate index, i, i subscript i, because also the index could change during the periods, yeah? It could be that in the first period you pay a three months forward rate, then you pay a six months forward rate, then you pay a backward rate, that could happen. You just pay an index with the fixing time t i superscript f. So this means that this guy is f t i superscript f measurable. Only condition is it has to be t i superscript f is less or equal t i superscript p because you have to know what you pay before or when you pay it. So this is my floating index. So it is a random variable. Yeah, it's called my floating rate. And I have a fixed rate, which is my SI and I pay II plus SI at the end of the period, maybe usually, yeah, but more generally in TI superscript P. So this is now my generalized situation. My generalized swap is just two such swap rates with maybe different indices, one floating, the other, for example, only fixed, but also, for example, with different frequencies. So the swap is just a portfolio of two such swap rates, one with a plus, the receiver leg, one with a minus. And my simple textbook swap is just a special case of this, okay? Choosing, fixing at the beginning of the period, payment at the end of the period. And the index is the L and the S is the zero for the float leg or the other way around, index is zero and S is some constant for the fixed leg. If I have this definition, do I know a value? Do I know the value of the swap? Well, if if I have this very general definition here, then maybe no. Yeah, I do not know how to value this because I have not even specify what is this random variable I pay here. I can easily value here the fixed leg because it's just the value of SI multiplied with the zero copper bond at the payment time. Yeah, so maybe let's note this. Okay, so what about, what about the value? Okay, for the SI, I know that 
the value is SI times the zero cobalt bond that pays at the payment time, one unit, observed in little t. So if I would like to value it in little t. But what about the term with the index? So this is my I, I, T, I, F. So what's the value? In the classical formula of the swap, I had that this is the index at evaluation time multiplied with the zero copper bond at payment time. So do I have something like this? Maybe not. Okay, but now if you go back to our little proof of where we proved the value of the floater. So maybe this guy here, yeah, where we considered, okay, valuing means take the expectation of the payment divided by the numeraire. Uh, so under the equivalent martingale measure, so maybe here, take the expectation of the value divided by the numeraire under the equivalent martingale measure. Then if I just plug this definition now into this proof, yeah, we could do something. We could just define this here as the corresponding conditional expectation. Then this formula would hold. Now, this is a bit. This is a little bit brutal, yeah. Uh, but actually, I did not specify that this here should be a stochastic process. I just told you there is a random variable which I pay, and now I would like to express this value of this payment in a nice form. Yeah? So this is just a way of decomposing the valuation into valuation of say more atomic components, namely the valuation of a fixed payment, which should be S times P, yeah, because it is S times P, I know that, and the valuation of the floating payment, which I would like to have represented with an I times P, I observed in little t, by definition. So this is decomposing the value into value of more yeah, um, atomic components. So then later, our exercise is to determine this guy here, what is the zero copper bond, and determine this guy here, because if I then have all these components, I can reverse and I can value all swaps. Yeah? So all such linear combinations here, can be valued if I have these two ingredients, the zero copper bond value corresponding to the value of a fixed payment and the index expectation under the equivalent martingale measure uh, relative to say this Lumaria. Okay, so that's the thing. I now express the value of this generalized swap. So I have for the value of the generalized swap that I can express it. So the value in time little t as a sum of sum f. This is now my i of little t, i subscript i of little t from the previous slide yeah, plus si. I can express it as a sum of some quantity F, which depends on the fixing, the payment, yeah, actually also on the index, whatever I pay, observed in little t plus SI. Yeah, so here's a it's a plus because it is just a swap leg, yeah. So recall later, I will either choose here the i equals zero and this will be a constant or a minus. I will choose the s to be zero and I can choose this guy here. Yeah? So if you have a plus or minus here, 
it's just a sign of the S, whatever you can, you can create all kinds of payments if you know this swap leg. Multiplied with the period length, multiplied with the bond that corresponds to the payment time. So the value of my generalized swap is given by this expression. When I just define now, okay, the P is my usual, usual zero copper bond. So it is one unit of currency paid in TI superscript P. Yeah? It's the definition of my zero copper bond. And now I define an additional um, quantity, my forward rate, uh, or my index expectation is defined as valuing paying one unit of the index. So I now pay one unit of the index in time TI superscript P. And since this here, this times the bond should represent paying this index, uh, I have to take the value of this payment and divide it by the zero comma bond. Yeah, this looks a little bit trivial, but actually this is now how the market works. We will observe these generalized swaps and from this formula, we can now extract from these observations if we observe enough quantities. Uh, for example, if we observe enough fixed payments and enough floating payments, we can then extract these objects. And actually this is also working yeah, completely independent of if you observe the interest rate that is associated with the corresponding circular bond. So I have this also in our library and maybe we discuss this in then a separate session. So you find here some section on market data, you find their products and in the product there's the swap, which is just, just a linear combinations of two different legs, the receiver leg and the payer leg, one with a plus, one with a minus. And there is this generalized swap leg, which just has a schedule and then some specifications of what curve we use for valuing an index and what curve we use for valuing the zero copper -Cool bond. This is called forward curve and discount curve. So let's state this. So the first ingredients we need to value the swap is my zero copper bond. This is called the discount curve. And the second ingredients to value my swap leg is the value of a payment of the index divided by the zero copper bond, which is called my forward curve. Yeah, it is the natural analog to the forward rate, but now specified for a very general index. With these two ingredients, I can value all kind of linear combinations or other way around. If I observe the value of different linear combinations, I can extract these two quantities. The second procedure is called curve calibration. How do we find the interest rate curve that matches our observed financial products that pay linear combinations of floating indices and fixed um, payments. So that was now my generalized swap. My index is now general. So I can also plug in the backward rate. And if the backward rate is constructed with daily accruing daily rates, yeah, for example, our short-term rate, you know, so I define a backward rate based on this short-term rate. Then this is the so-called overnight index swap, you know, also 
very popular, which means on one side you accrue daily overnight the small interest rate, and then every three months, yeah, you swap this against a fixed payment. Uh, two things come now together. We have our nice little generalization. For example, here, if I pay an index, I just define here this quantity as the valuation of this index as the expectation. And then I have our little lemma on the backward rate. So paying the backward rate, you recall, the backward rate is if you have this accrual account, so you always invest here in the next zero couple bond, yeah, so small investments like this, you accrue some interest over this time, you take the performance of this account, you define the backward rate. If you have the backward rate and you consider paying the backward rate at the end of the period, and you take the expectation of this, then this agrees with paying the forward rate L. So actually we had, if we value paying this index, then we get L times P. So if I now go to our generalized definition, And in my generalized definition, this here is a backward rate. Then my valuation here uses this definition, but for my little lemma, I know that this is just the classical forward rate. So I can just now say that valuing a swap on the backward rate is just the same valuation formula as valuing a swap on the forward rate where this guy here is just the forward rate curve. Yeah? So this here is just the forward rate curve. So I have a swap on the backward rate. So now I use for my little index here, I, so this is my floating rate index. I, I use the definition here with my accrual account R and if I have a swap on the backward rate, this index here is the backward rate, but from my previous little lemma, I know that now the value is the forward rate minus the fixed rate times the period length times the zero copper bond. Okay, so the value of the swap on the backward rate and the swap on the forward rate agree. Yeah? So for a swap, it does not make a difference if the market is switching from forward rates to backward rates. Yeah, let's conclude uh, maybe again with a few names. Yeah. So what is a bond? What is a swap? So actually I have here the very general definition of a swap leg. So a swap leg is just a single side, a single payment stream on um, a schedule. So that looks actually, that looks exactly what a bond does. So a bond is a single sided, yeah, only one side pays, yeah. And a swap is somehow an exchange. But from my programming side, the two are maybe very, very, very similar. Also, the terms fixed leg and float leg, they are not so precise. Yeah, you can have a float leg that also have has um, a fixed um, component. I consider here only linear product. So if you have a more complex function, then this is often termed structured. So there could be a structured bond, a structured swap, which means where the coupons 
uh, maybe a little bit more complicated functions. They could be have a cap. Yeah, they pay you know, only the minimum of something and some number, or they could have a floor. Yeah, so they could have some embedded options. Yeah, then this is called structured bond, structured swap. Okay, and the other terms. Yeah, we already had floating, fixed, and so on. So we have five minutes left and I have a nice conclusion. Uh, when I started the section, I mentioned that, okay, these are the linear products. And that was maybe also very transparent in the last part where I very brutally defined the valuation formula using the conditional expectation because it means I decompose the values of products into a linear combination of some basis values. Yeah? So like linear algebra, the zero copper bond and the forward are a little bit my basis vectors. Yeah? Not, not exactly, it's the forward times the zero copper bond, but then you can decompose all these products into the values of these individual components. If we go back to the proof where we have proven the value of the floater, so this guy here, that is a little bit this region here now where we now define all the values as expectations, Martingale measures. But we also had this version of the proof, which worked without all this stuff by just considering that I buy a product of which I know the value. And this technique, considering the value as the value of some product which I buy, yeah. So this is called replication. You consider the replication portfolio. And for these linear products, we could do static replication, which means I have a replication strategy that I know from the beginning. There is no stochastic dependency in my replication strategy. So this is in contrast to dynamic hedging, dynamic replication, which you maybe already know, where you define your actions based on something that you observe at the time when you do the action, but which you do not know before. Here, static replication, I know all the actions from the beginning. And let's conclude by looking at static replication uh, for our two products, yeah? paying the forward rate and paying the backward rate. So static replication here is possible because the payment is actually somehow linked to the index that we pay. So we have some kind of natural payment date the forward rate and the backward rate are paid at the end of the period. It's for example, not possible if they pay it at a different time. So it's related to the fact that we have linear product. So we can perform static replication. So we decompose our products into products we can observe on the market. First example, Let's do static replication for the forward rate L paid at the end of the period. So I have L of Ti to Ti plus one. The rate is fixed at the beginning of the period and it is paid at the end of the period. We know from our theorem, our little theorem value on the floater. So paying this guy here times period length, okay, at the end of the period is just the value of the forward rate observed today times the value of the zero copper bond observed today. And 
this is, if you plug in the definition of the uh, format rate, so of this guy here, yeah? So this is the bond at the beginning minus the bond at the end, divided by the bond at the end. So the bond at the end cancels, divided by the period length, this cancels, all, cancels also. So it is a portfolio of two products. It is the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period. So let's start with this portfolio. So if this is the value of this payment, so this is the portfolio I have to buy to create this payment. So let's start with this portfolio and check if we can really replicate this payment. So I start with this portfolio. So it, I mean, it means in little t, I own one unit of this bond and I sell one unit of this bond. So one unit of the bond that matures at the beginning of the period minus one unit at the bond that matures at the end of the period. What happens if I then reach the point TI? So in TI, I have that the bond that matures at the beginning of the period is equal to one. So my portfolio has the value one unit of currency minus that bond that matures at the end of the period period. Then I do some trading activity. I use this one unit and I now buy the bond that matures at the end of the period. Okay, so I buy the bond that matures at the end of the period, this guy here. So, but maybe now I use a different color because I buy it again here. The other one was sold. How many units can I buy? Well, I have one unit of currency, this is the value of the bond. So I can buy that many units of this bond. So I can buy one divided by P Ti plus one units of the P Ti plus one bond. Now I keep this portfolio. So my portfolio is now this here, this here minus one, units of this bond. Then I keep this portfolio and I wait till the end of the period. So now I wait till the end of the period. So in Ti plus one, so this here is Ti plus one. And I observe that I have my portfolio, which is that many units that many units of this zero copper bond, but my zero copper bond has now value one. And now if you check, this is exactly what I have to replicate. So this is exactly my payoff, my forward rate. Okay, so I would like to replicate here this payment. Okay, so you see that we have valued the cost of replication. And the static replication also works for our backward looking rate. So now let's have a look at the backward looking rate. I would like to create this payment at the end of the period. So my theorem stays the value is the same. So the value is the bond at the beginning of the period minus the bond at the end of the period. Okay, so let's start in little t with exactly this portfolio. Okay, one short, one long. If I approach ti, the value is again as before, I have one unit of currency, this is the bond that now matures, minus this bond. And what do I do now? Well, my backward rate is defined in terms of this accrual account, so this repeated reinvestment. So let's just use this one unit of currency. So I use now this one unit of currency to buy that many units here. So one divided by the R of this accrual account R. So I buy now this accrual account R. 
Then I wait till the end of the period. Okay, and what do I have at the end of the period? Yeah, I have, how many units do I have? I have that many units of this guy here, minus the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the period. And this is the one. And you see that this is exactly the definition of our performance rate. Okay, that was it for today. <laughs>